This is the e-learning podcast, episode number 64. Mm-hmm. Particularly in the work that we do. I mean, we are we are dealing with strong interpersonal skills of how to manage either a disability or a really challenging behavior. So one of the things we want to do is provide people with a level of confidence, but also confidence that they can do it. Welcome to the e-learning podcast. My name is Laddick and I'm your host from LMSPulse.com. My guest for today is Ben Jones. Ben is the Learning and Development Manager for Alambicare, an institution based in New South Wales, Australia, that provides care for some of the world's most vulnerable children. In this supportive conversation, Ben and I talk about the history, journey, and focus of the work of Alambicare and how they support vulnerable children with services like foster care, learning support, and much, much more. We also talk about how the institution has created and sustained the very successful Learning Without Walls program that includes so much more than just academic support. Ben and I also talk about how Alambicare pivoted in the pandemic to make sure that they were still able to provide necessary training and support to their staff, even with the double trouble of newly instated minimum requirements for many positions. Ben and I also talk about how Alambicare has used a monthly virtual lounge to create a team feeling and connection and validate critical training points with more experienced staff, especially with new employees in a very high turnover sector. We also talk about how they have overcome necessary in-person training outcomes around things like active listening in their virtual environment and how informal virtual meetings have become a habit to continue to forge those collegial bonds that we used to do just naturally. We also talk about how going virtual is fundamentally changing the way Alambicare structures and delivers induction training and with, you know, serious cost savings. And then finally, Ben and I talk about many, many aha breakthroughs that he had over the pandemic that has moved him from, you can't do this virtually to, wow, look at what's possible. But before we get started, a quick word from our sponsors. The e-learning podcast is sponsored by the e-learning success summit. Learn from more than 40 experts how to teach, work, and learn online without being overwhelmed. Get your free ticket to the summit at elearningsuccesssummit.com and lmspulse.com, your best source for news, information, and resources for e-learning professionals for more than 10 years. Get our free roundup of the week's top news at lmspulse.com. Hello, Ben. Welcome to the e-learning podcast. How are you today? I'm fantastic, mate. It's nice and nice and early and looking forward to chatting. Oh, man. You know, this is one of the coolest things about doing a, a global show. Like, I guess this is one of the coolest things about e-learning in general, right? It's You can you can do it anytime, anywhere. Um, where do we find you sitting today? Yeah, so I'm coming from New South Wales in Australia. So probably about two hours outside the capital, Sydney. All right. Two hours. As, I, as we were talking in the green room before that, I had the privilege of visiting Sydney a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic started. Lovely little town you have there. Lovely little town. Um, and I'm, as everybody knows, I'm, I'm coming from Mexico City. So we're literally on opposite sides of the planet. Um, I've already teed you up in the introduction to, uh, to the show here and talked about, you know, the bullet points that we went through and whatnot. But why don't you give us the, the, the 15, 30 seconds uh, and introduce yourself about who is Ben Jones? Yeah. Yeah. So my name is Ben Jones and I'm a learning and development manager with a company called Alambi Care. And basically, we provide care to many of the world's most vulnerable children. Uh, outside of that role as well, I also uh, coach a therapeutic crisis intervention course Australia-wide on behalf of Cornell University over in your neck of the woods. Over yeah, the US. That's, uh, I, I'm going to love this conversation because it's it's about a use case, right? It's like, how are we using e-learning to be effective, especially in, in this time of, of the pandemic, right? Speaking of which, I've been using the podcast as a time capsule a little bit uh, to to kind of learn about what is happening with COVID around the world. We're recording this on my September 14th, your September 15th. Uh, What's the COVID situation like in New South Wales right now? Yeah, so no doubt the world looks a little bit different since COVID started, but particularly in Australia right at the moment, uh, I feel like we've probably got a good 12 months delay from the rest of the world being so isolated. Um, But the most recent 12 weeks, it has hit us hard. Mm. Uh, The case numbers are drastically higher, um, but our government, I guess, has really cracked down on the pandemic. And what that means is for the past 12 weeks, uh, most of our capital cities have been in lockdown. Uh, Our state borders are actually closed with no travel whatsoever between them. 
Uh, and the only reason you are able to leave your house is for healthcare, one household member to grab groceries, uh, or lastly, if you're in essential services. Mm. And what that means is grandparents aren't able to visit grandchildren, um, young people aren't able to interact. So it's, it's very, very isolating. And lots of those required trainings for workplace environments have not been able to go ahead. So your meetings, your inductions, uh, your essential trainings, it's just been a real nightmare. So the ability to connect virtually uh, is one thing that's a bit of a, a saving light, uh, albeit you certainly don't get those interpersonal skills that you would get face to face, but it's mm-hmm. somewhat kept Australia going. But very difficult times. We're also at a stage where there is no clear communication as to when we'll get out of the pandemic. Um, Nationwide, they come out yesterday saying that once we hit 70% double vaccination rates, uh, some freedoms will be open, but there's no communication as to when that will be and what the freedoms will look like. So very, very interesting times, which is causing lots of unrest as well. I'm also just wondering, how do you get vaccinated if you can't leave your house? Even worse than that, so you are able to go and get vaccinated as an essential reason, uh, but even worse than that, they're saying that our double vaccination rates need to increase, uh, but locally, at least where I am, which is a pretty city area, um, there are no bookings available for the vaccination until November. So there's also a, quite quite a shortage <laughs> in supply. <laughs> I'm going to let that just kind of explode in my brain for a second. Wow, that is yeah. intense. That is intense. Uh, so... Let's let's circle back to that, and let's let's circle back yep. to see how how has Alambi Care worked over this, you know, in this sort of distance learning necessity. But for, before we do that, like you said, that you are serving some of the world's most vulnerable children. Give us give us a little bit of background, like what yep. uh, you know, where did Alambi Care come from? How big is it? Where are you touching all corners of yep. Australia, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, cool. Great. So Alambi Care, I guess, has been around since the early 80s, and it's a service that is completely not-for-profit run um, and is established by some really giving people. Um, It basically started off in the 80s as a refuge, and it was a place where children that were homeless or kicked out of home for whatever reason could go and be supported to either reconnect with family and the community. Um, Throughout time, we've had lots of different adaptations and new programs, uh, and Alambi, as we see it today, supports Um, many of the, I guess, the country's most vulnerable people through a range of tailored services and programs. Um, This includes things like children that are living in forced out-of-home care so that can't live with their families due to abuse and neglect and those sorts of reasons. Uh, We've got a huge disability sector, homelessness, uh, refuges, I guess. We do in the community supports for families um, and right down to things like children that are completely disengaged from school. We've got a Learning Without Walls walls program um but basically at the moment we have roughly a thousand staff and they work across two states so new south wales and victoria mm. but we are certainly one of the largest out-of-home care providers and uh, that, without doubt and what's the ratio of of you know sort of staff to actual people you're supporting and like what's how many how many people are you supporting right now yeah it's really difficult so we we service hundreds of families in the community our actual in-home care services. So we have kids that are removed and for extreme reasons aren't able to be placed with foster carers. Now that's a range of reasons. It may just be general availability of people that are willing to take on full-time placements. Um, But predominantly we get those children, I guess, that have experienced that ongoing developmental trauma and their behaviours are are really difficult to manage. Um, So they need those wraparound supports of clinicians and intensive direct care workers to help stabilize their behaviors and reconnect them with family community or i guess as a last resort those caring foster carers that unfortunately there isn't always an abundance of Mm -hmm. take me first to the 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 school without walls was that what is has that been around since the 80s is that a new innovative sort of e-learning distance learning program like like what is that yeah so one of the great things about a lambie care is that we're a not-for-profit So Mm -hmm. lots of those funds and resources that we have, we're able to tailor programs that meet the need, not the contractual obligation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll give you, we'll pay you for this service to get this. So one of the programs we have is Learning Without Walls and it's it's a really successful program. So if you picture kids at a mainstream school setting that are dealing with a lot of emotional trauma and challenging behaviours, wanting to be home and vice versa, um, schools are pretty quick, and I'm not targeting schools by any stretch, but pretty quick to 
have to meet the needs of the whole class. So those children that we care for are usually the ones that are suspended quite early on mm-hmm. in the piece. We then have a range of fallback schools, which are known as behavioural schools. Um, but some of the behaviours and reluctance to go from our kids uh, sees them get expelled or suspended from even the behavioural schools. And the last resort, which unfortunately is the reality for many of the children we support, is that they get given distance education packages and expected to do work at home. Uh, you could imagine how that looks. Just so, to say the person who is l- least likely to complete the distance <laughs> education is given that as the, this is this is your, okay, wow, that's intense. Yeah. Exactly. And the, yeah, the big thing with that too is that it's not necessarily just the information or the education they miss out on, but you think of those social skills. So our kids are typically the ones that can't just jump on their bike at the end of the day and hang out with the neighbourhood. So that social interaction that you get from school, seeing kids your age, um, all that stuff they miss out on. We've developed a school called the Learning Without Walls program, which is completely self-funded. We have school teachers there that take kids through work and, and they don't realise that it's not a formal school setting in terms of you know, the government's eyes. It's more of a, we're certainly going for accreditation, but it's one of those things where kids come to school, they're able to interact with kids their own age, they're taken through learning in a tailored way. And those teachers that look after them have got specific training around supporting children with high needs behaviors. Mm. So how, you know, kind of take me into LMB care and tell me why is, what was e-learning, was online learning an important thing? Was this something that you were already considering, you were already implementing for your staff, for your, you know, professional development pre-pandemic? Or was this a necessity that like much of the world you kind of discovered, holy smokes, we still need to be able to deliver. And so we're going to have to pivot really quick and, and bring this on board. Yeah, so taking taking us back pre-pandemic, one of the things we've always hung our hat on is training. Uh, obviously, the key focus of any training should be to enhance the performance of the individual as well as the organisation. So we've really never looked at training as a tick box or a compliance area, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. particularly in the work that we do. I mean, we are we are dealing with strong interpersonal skills of how to manage either a disability or a really challenging behaviour. So one of the things we want to do is provide people with a level of competence, but also confidence that they can do it. Mm. It's amazing how just walking out of a training, you you can't wait to get into it as opposed to have all these anxieties around what if X, Y, or Z happens. Um, In consultation with that, the sector in Australia actually brought out minimum qualifications, um, which raised a lot of concerns for our frontline staff. And that's sector-wide. What does that mean? They brought out minimum qualifications like like specifically that you need to have a college degree or yeah so in australia in new south wales where i am it was actually a diploma qualification which Mm. is quite a high level it's a management qualification Mm. um now our carers their primary goal is to have a big heart be empathetic caring and understanding um you know they're able to go to a, a roof and talk a kid down from jumping or from getting up a tree or putting down a weapon yet walking into a classroom environment causes them far greater anxiety than any of that Um, Even to the point where we've had ex-mechanics, ex-military that come in, sit with our kids, form amazing connections, but really struggle to write what they would like to achieve in a supervision form. So you could imagine, uh, I guess, the the anxieties they had about going external to a Lambie Care to get a qualification. Mm. Um, The other flip side of that, which is worth noting, is that these people were often going for 40 hours a week on the front line to then needing to travel in their own time to a, a college setting and sure. walking into a classroom after hours, mixing that on top of family life. Mm. So again, our CEO, who's quite innovative, said, you know, how can we help these people obtain what they need and recognize the work they're doing? Before, rather than have yeah, so, yeah, sorry, I apologize. You know, we had that little tiny delay because we're on the other side opposite sides of the planet there. <laughs> before we before you take me into the to the the innovation, just so that Um, the nomenclature is the same, you know, like when I hear the term diploma, you know, my American ears think like a high school diploma. Is that what we're talking about here? Or is it like uh, there's a kind of certification because there's tons and tons of talk in the e-learning universe right now about certifications that colleges are offering like through, through LinkedIn and other sort of courses or or other um, professional certifications. Like, give me like, can we compare apples to apples real quick? Yep. Yeah, for sure. So our skills framework, we have um, year 12, which is senior school. Like, So you would finish high school in year 12 in Australia Mm -hmm. um, and you obtain a qualification called a school certificate. Okay. So Mm -hmm. that's pretty much the end of school. Um, The next thing you would do is go along and we've got a thing called a a skills 
what would you call it? The vet sector, it's called. Okay. Vocational education. Okay, sure. mm-hmm. So so our vet sector has certificate one, certificate two, certificate three, certificate four, um, which just go up in grades each time. Sure. The one above that is a diploma. Okay. And then the one above that is a graduate diploma. And then what you would have to do is leave the vet sector and go into a university sector to obtain a degree. Wow. So, so yeah, uh, I mean, we're talking a significant effort here. I mean, if there's four, four certificate levels to get to the diploma level, I mean, I'm thinking like an electrician, you know, it's like that yep. first apprenticeship to a journeyman, to a blah, 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 to, you know, like going up the ladder. That's, that's a, that's a significant uh, effort to, to get there. It, okay. it is. And it was really difficult because we had to, uh, I guess, design our content to be a little more than off the box because the minimum qualification that was set by the government being a diploma is a, is a management qualification. So we would have people in the training room that were really content and happy being that of a direct care worker providing care for vulnerable children. But I guess the the level of education we had to provide them was them writing case plans mm. to manage that young person's complex life, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, even though that mm-hmm. was never their intention or want to obtain that. Um, so what we've seen in Australia was a lot of issues around, I guess, some training organisations maybe lowering the standard of content, thinking we'll do this to get people over the line. Mm-hmm. Um, and what happens is now that that qualification that's a minimum is now widely offered. Um, but obviously the quality of, of that is going sure. to really vary. So part of what we wanted to design was we're very happy with the, I guess, the level of training. We've got some sector leaders across a number of fields that work for us. Even internationally, we've got a lot of consultants. So we're able to include them in the content and know that what we were going to deliver would meet the needs of those people we we are required to support. Um, So our journey then started with looking at, you know, we we can get people in the classroom and teach them, but also we need an online platform. We need something that people can access in their own time. Mm -hmm. And being being in our sector, um, which does support vulnerable people, I guess some of the concerns we had was around confidentiality accessing our databases and, sure. and things like that. Um, many security barriers. So a lot of our programs and things that we access can't be accessed from outside our placements or workspace. Um, so we really needed to look for something external that we could lock down if need be. Um, a lot more security, I guess, a lot more security than your, your typical training packages. I'm sure. Um, okay, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So we had to, uh, I guess, get up to speed really quick. I, I used it as the equivalent of our training team in terms of content delivery, we're all qualified graduates, um, but our journey through e-learning was almost very elementary or primary school. <laughs> Getting so, up to speed as quick as we could. But and so, take me back. You 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 saw this. So and this was all pre-pandemic, correct? This was pre-pandemic. Yeah the the actual grad uh, qualification route was pre pre mm. The actual <laughs> qualification route was pre-pandemic. Um, I guess what wasn't planned though is once the pandemic hit particularly the last 12 weeks um our onboarding or induction journey is five days straight of classroom training Uh so over the last 12 weeks we've just had to adapt everything that we do to be able to deliver that virtually as well so it's been a really interesting experience and yeah and help me understand that so how often like what kind of turnover do you have or what kind of are you like a growing expanding organization that you know you're bringing on more people every day is it their kind of regular turnover of of staff just for whatever reason, you know, either burnout yeah. or, or they're moving on to a new career or something like that? Or Yeah, due to the high nature of work that we do, you do see large turnover in this sector. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it is difficult. Uh, so what we do is we do a monthly induction of 20 staff per month. Okay. Um, we do have a really robust onboarding system though. So once they join us, they receive five days training straight off, off the go. And we cover policies, procedures, uh, our framework training, as well as some interactive out of your chair sort of courses around managing complex behaviour. Uh, once that's finished, they then go into a six-month probationary learning journey that we've mm. been able to, to use through our e-learning through the Moodle platform alongside our partners, e-creators. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, so what we're able to do is they jump on each week and they're sort of drip-fed one unit per week, which is about an hour in duration. Um, but it's got lots of those interpersonal videos about how do I do my role? We've uploaded private videos of current staff that are talking them through some of their challenges and experiences at similar stages in the role, I guess, um, as well as some of those management teams that come in and talk more to the complexities of it. What we're also able to do is 
each hour's learning has a reflection piece. So at the end of the training, those staff are able to, I guess, look at their own journey and they might have just learned about the importance of children feeling safe in their induction. Mm -hmm. Um, But let's say week one journey might actually be, what have you done to help a child feel safe this week? Um, You know, we talk about the importance of something as essential as self-care, which goes in one ear in the training and you're motivated, but the next week it's, you know, straight out the other side. (laughs) Um, So what it's able to do is at that second week is it's now saying, you know, let's actually unpack this and take it from the classroom. You've been here two weeks now. What is it you are doing to look after yourself? Could you be doing something better? Are you happy with your level of self-care? Are you reaching out to those that, you know, are in your network for support? So it's actually not just teaching, but applying the principles, which I think has always been the challenge with with training. Uh, I liken it to something like a first aid course. You know, you walk out wanting to change the world and you know how to wrap a snake bite. And uh, sort of within a month, if you're not actively using that first aid certificate, you struggle to even remember how many compressions for CPR. Yeah, okay. Uh, Tell me about where, where my brain is going right now is even putting aside the pandemic right now, did you find that new staff when they were coming in, did they interact within this e-learning platform or did you have a different, I'm, I'm looking, I'm interested in sort of the community that it built, right? Especially yeah. if they have sort of a weekly check-in or a new lesson or you know, a, you know, a new reflection point, as you were saying, is that then uh, you know part of a larger forum or part of a larger you know community space where people can share their experiences and those kinds of things? Yeah. So one of the great things with any training is the networking that happens between it. So we can deliver content, but what we do miss in the in-person is those conversations during morning tea, during lunchtime, Mm. Mm. uh, those sorts of things. So the e-learning platform, we we did have to think about how can we continue to engage them. Now, there's obvious benefits with e-learning being that they're able to access this off their smartphone. They're doing it whilst they're on shift. Um, They're still Mm. able to go about their own personal life, which is great. Um, But one of the big things is that connection. So what we've been able to do is with the induction being virtual, um, we've created cohorts where we use platforms like Zoom to communicate. We've got discussion threads, but they sort of fizzle out, for lack of a better word. You see the first two or three months worth of posting and people are connecting, talking about their experience. So what we have implemented is what we call a monthly virtual lounge. Um, And we go in with a very loose agenda But what we've been enabling our staff to do is just to connect, bring forward what are some challenges, what are some things you wish you knew. Um, And again, they've they've been very successful just in terms of that camaraderie. The front line can be a very lonely space. So thinking about your colleague and what their experience has been a good thing, Um, albeit once people hit about that six months in the role, people feel quite competent, content, they've built relationships within their workspace teams. But certainly that first six months connection is critical. Is there um, value? Let's. I'm if I'm if I'm an Olympic Care person who's been around. Let's even just say five years. Is there value for me coming back there? Do I have to get recertified? Do I have to you know upskill at any point? You know, do do I come back to that community other than to share experience and lift others? You know, new people up. Um, wh- what's that interaction? Yeah, we have what we call um, we call it refresher training. Mm -hmm. Uh, And one of the benefits is quite often we'll bring existing staff back with inductees. Uh, It's one thing me as a trainer being up there talking, uh, but what you often get is is that view of I'm in my ivory tower. I've been removed from that direct care work for a little while and I can train a point. But as soon as a staff member validates that point, uh, I guess the buy-in from the front line is completely different. So Mm -hmm. we have used that a lot in the past, particularly around those teams with some struggles uh, we'll actually get them to come in and you watch them very quickly turn from prisoners to participants in the space of one question. That's mm. great. Prisoners <laughs> to participants. You've been in training for a while. I love it. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great characterization. Uh, what Take me to, you know, it, it, it sounds like there's lots of positives to this. What are the biggest challenges, especially, I guess, over these last 12 weeks, but even prior to that, like, is it getting buy-in? Is it that fizzle that you see in the forums? Is it, you know, yeah. the fact that you really still have to take virtual and turn it into physical? Like, what are the, what are the challenges that you've experienced that you're still kind of like, yeah. we got to figure this out? Yeah, the biggest challenges virtually, I think in our sector specifically, is this whole dynamic of can you train it online? Mm-hmm. Um, what, what that means is, um, and I'm not throwing other services under the bus but i believe if i needed to be shown something in accounting or how to use an excel database 
I believe you could do that very adequately in a virtual space. We could screen share, we could take our time, we could screen grab the recording. The issue comes when you're talking about interpersonal skills, about managing someone with extremely challenging emotional behaviour, developmental trauma, um, and you take a skill as simple as let's practice active listening. Mm. You know, at the moment, uh, we've had the opportunity to connect virtually, but I still haven't stood next to you. I haven't seen your mannerisms, your body language, your posture. Uh, it's difficult to pick up tone of voice. You've got constant dropouts. And part of what we do in the human services sector is a ton of role plays. Uh, so even though we've got things like breakout room features, uh, it certainly doesn't hit the mark in terms of thinking about your spacing, whether you're seated next to a person, um, your eye contact, your body language, things like that. So some of those skills that we are required to use in everyday practice, I believe, are struggling to be hit virtually. Um, and what that's created in, in our view is there's a lot of um, benefits to e-learning in terms of cost savings. So we're not booking training venues. We're able to get everyone together at short notice. Lots of these benefits. But what agencies are finding is, hey, we did an induction last week with 20 people and the bottom dollar was this. So this is an incredibly successful outcome if you look at it through that lens. So there's now this expectation of, hey, what if we only did one day in person and the other four days we could do virtually? Mm -hmm. And there's pros and cons for that, but there's many challenges that we're facing. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of, the, one of the other big challenges that we're facing with this virtual world at the minute as well is just the lack of connection. Um, I find that uh, even though we're all so accessible, I caught up with my team in person um, just prior to pandemic because we've sort of been in and out of lockdown. And they said that they didn't realise the level of informal conversation that they had through the day and the mm -hmm. outcome that had. Mm -hmm. And even when we, we have these catch-ups, people get to the meeting that starts at 9 and by 9.03 9 we're talking about content. Mm -hmm. It's none of this how was your weekend, that sort of thing. And, and even when we have those informal catch-ups, you know, one person will talk and share and if there's three or four people uh, very quickly, you're moving on to content or the stronger personalities in the virtual room are, are overlapping. Uh, so what we've had to do is, particularly in my smaller team, is we have informal meetings now throughout the day. So just before morning tea, we'll arrange a time to catch up and it is no work talk. Uh, it is how are you doing? And it's those mm -hmm. chats that used to happen by the printer, by the coffee machine sure. that uh, I guess is able to bring that level of connection in. I'm a huge believer in the the rehumanization of, you know, even though I'm, I am an e-learning e -learning advocate, that is my, literally my yeah. job, my title, but what has just become so absolutely clear over the last 16, 18 months, and now you're experiencing over the last 12 weeks is that we, it's these unwritten pieces that we just never talked about are, are just absolutely critical, even though you can't sometimes even put your fingers on it. Um, you know, it's the person who does bring the, you know, America that brings the donuts into the, yeah. you know, and, you know, on, on the, on the random Wednesday or Thursday and everybody kind of gathers around and, you know, just sort of chats for a bit, or it's, it's that meeting in the hallway or, you know, the, the impromptu phone call or something like that, uh, yeah. that really give us that, that, that connection that we need that make us believe. Right. Yeah. And you... I think what you're doing, Stephen, is fantastic. Cause I think, um, lots of the roadblocks that I myself have been guilty of throwing up that you can't achieve in e-learning is honestly due to it being in such infancy um, mm. across mm -hmm. our sector or across my experience. Um, so when you say, you know, you miss those informal coffee chats, bam, you know, you can introduce something as creative as no work talk for five minutes. Right. Um, mm -hmm. When you talk about some of the complexities and things that can't be met, you then find out there's other platforms like Vimeo or Monday.com or Zoom or, or these things that, well, once road, roadblocks, you've got yourself, it's an e-learning specialist, that's then able to talk about, hey, is that really a challenge? Is there a way that maybe we could come up with something a bit more innovative to, to achieve those outcomes? Um, whether it's something as small as breakout rooms and matching people that normally wouldn't sit together and, and achieving these, these things in a different style. Um, and I think it's the, the struggle in this that sometimes when you get professionals that have done something a certain way for so long, anything that's a change brings that level of angst. So we dig our heels in a little bit <laughs> as opposed to being truly open about, hey, what can we learn from this and how can we actually benefit? Because there are lots of benefits from it. Well, let me riff off that for a second then. One of the interesting things that I'm certainly discovering over the last 12, again, 16 months or so is what we tend to do is that we tend to take this new platform that we have. In your case, it's you know the e-creators platform, um, 
And what we do is we try to replicate what we did or what we do in the real world using these other tools, right? So it's basically, we're just kind of, right. you know, pushing what we used to do live into those rather than saying, how can we break this apart? You know, just kind of like, let's put all the pieces. What do we need to achieve? And how, how, can, we, uh, how can we achieve that in a different way? Have you experienced that at all, either with your practice or with when communicating with other organizations? It's like, wait, wow, you really just completely rethought that, but got to the outcome in a totally different way. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that you raise. That's that's a really interesting view on it. And I think it's a good one. We never really look at what are the outcomes and then reverse engineer. We always mm-hmm. look at, well, that doesn't fit because that functionality of it won't work. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a really good point. I think what we have been able to do more recently um, is look at the objectives of things like our diploma course. And mm-hmm. if they're required to, to complete a skill set, um, we've been able to really relax our expectations on that so in the past for example we have to have people come in in person and demonstrate a skill while we stand there with an assessor sheet and tick them off as competent Um, we probably always could have got them to film themselves doing something like that and send it in for us to assess but then the skepticism in us in a pre e-learning world was always no because they won't do it or there's no quality control (laughs) if they get it wrong they've got to refilm it Um, but due to necessity and the fact that we can't see them in person it's amazing how successful that has been Mm. in terms of working so small example but I guess it's that outside the box thinking and reverse engineering instead of saying it doesn't work yeah I'm even wondering in your in your particular profession right now again totally extemporaneous off the you know off the cuff here um, with some of the individuals that you're helping that you're providing services for that that moment potentially of hey let's create a video together or let's you know let's let's create a you know a, a TikTok together or something like that would really kind of be an avenue an opportunity to connect and you know explain behavior or or diffuse behavior or something like that um, really kind of I, I have no idea but could really be interesting because it's it's the social media of the day you know it's it's the it's the expectation of the day so who knows absolutely and even in person one of the biggest things you struggle with in a role play is nerves and that that energy that's required for a role play so bringing something funky where it is tiktok or or evdr i guess it's one of those things that people naturally bring a level Mm. of energy because it's different it's new um Mm. but i think just backing off what you said around um the reluctance to do things and that it, it reminds me a little bit about um you know a restaurant review you're always quick to run around and tell people about the bad meal you had (laughs) <laughs> um, not that it was not that it was a good meal. So I just I think when you have an experience with e-learning, if it doesn't hit the mark, because it's mm. I guess incredibly difficult to do as a trainer. You know, you see those glazed eyes, and you're not quite sure if they're looking at your face or if you know they've got a background window open. Absolutely. Like that. So, yeah. so some of those things can be I guess a, a little bit of a challenge as well. But um, I think as a trainer, the more skill set you bring the better the experience is. And there's so many great videos and tutorials and podcasts now that can up your e-learning game. Mm -hmm. And even little things that I've learned over the last 12 weeks have made a significant difference. Um, Little things like when I've got a group of 10, instead of saying to somebody, hey, what's your experience of relationships? It's actually using names. Hey, Stephen, what is your experience of relationships? To avoid everybody jumping in on each other. Mm. Um, you know, those little icebreakers, breakout rooms that you can have, uh, cutting content to 45 minute windows with a five minute break, uh, just lots of little ways to navigate. And you see that the actual learner feedback at the end of the course is almost mirroring your face to face training. That's even awesome. though in those early stages, it certainly doesn't feel like that. Mm. What about uh, other organizations that are similar to yours? Do you, are you connected to them and sort of, feeding off one another about what works, what doesn't work? Um, are you feeling like you're an innovator kind of, you know, on the kind of sort of leading edge in this space? Like what do what some of those conversations sound like? Yeah, I feel like uh, everybody in Australia itself has had to be somewhat innovative due to circumstance, particularly in New South Wales where lockdowns occurred. If you aren't able to do anything virtually, the reality is you aren't able to do anything. So people mm. have sort of skin their toes. I believe that we were really lucky with getting ahead of the game trying to get these qualifications because the the most recent 12-week lockdown, most of the software, the experiences, the systems that we are using are those that we had established as an innovative practice in our sector for the diploma. So it means that using systems like Zoom, like Teams, like Monday.com, like Moodle, our relationship with eCreators, securing videos through Vimeo prior to uploading them, all these little things that we have learned 
haven't been a skills jump to get there. So mm-hmm. what we've been able to focus our energy on is how do I get the content to an uploaded state as opposed to, oh, my goodness, how do I get any sort of state <laughs> at all to upload content? <laughs> so it's been a, a real blessing in disguise. Last question uh, for you. I asked this for, for everybody who's on the podcast. Obviously, other than getting out of lockdown, what is it that you're oh, yeah. looking for? What, what, what are you looking forward to over the next sort of six months, 12 months in terms of it could be anything. It doesn't necessarily even have to be about your program or a or anything. Like, what are you listening to? What are you paying attention to? It could be a shiny new object. It could be a new process. It could be something that you're, you know, wow, this is, this is going to make a difference, you know, in the next six to 12 months. Is there anything that you'd like to give a shout out to? Yeah, absolutely. I think what I would love to do is we've been forced to have a lot of digital change. We've been forced to get out of the classroom and deliver virtually. Um, And although there's been challenges at times, there's also been some incredible benefits. And what I'm most looking forward to and most excited about is is doing a review, a review with my team, with my learners and finding out what worked and what didn't. Mm. Because what I'd love to develop is a hybrid, something where we can refine the processes and not just go, that was a dark period where everything has had to be adjusted. But hey, what did we actually learn from that period? And whether it's something as simple as our face-to-face training days can be reduced, allowing people to complete elements in their own time virtually from things we've learned, whether it's continuing virtual lounge sessions as a way to connect with staff, but really doing this 360 review once lockdown ends and say, hey, before we just revert to old habits, let's think about a hybrid here. Let's think about what did we enjoy? What did we miss? But also what will we miss once this pandemic's over? And I think mm-hmm. with that solution, not only will we have a better outcome for our trainers, I think for the learners as well. Is there ever a time when you think that we'll stop using the term hybrid and that'll just be, Ooh. This, this is, we'd this have is, to come up with is, a hybrid for a hybrid, right? This is the normal. I'm, I'm just wondering, <laughs> is that what, is, you know, can, well, is it my kids that will think this is just super normal? Or, you know, is it, is it you and I in our, in still in our adult life, sort of our professional life where it's kind of like, of course there's, you know, there's some part in some, you know, some part physical, some part not. I don't know. I, I wonder yeah. that myself. I'm trying to avoid the new norm because I feel like the Australian media just hammers that. But you're absolutely right in terms of a changing space. And yeah. I, I guess a quick example of one: I, uh, I've got a a young baby, and that preschool now it's no longer. This is a camera. It's this is a camera. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's wow! Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I think I heard that one the other day too, where it's like, yeah, and this is that like this isn't a phone, you know, or it's the thumb, the thumb and finger. It's it's the hand, you know. You put your hand up to your because like, everybody's got. It's very crazy, right? <laughs> it's uh, I do I do often just look at things like this pandemic that we've experienced though, and particularly in Australia with the twelve week lockdown. And I'm looking at kids today that it's so tough for them to sit there and play Xbox Live with their friends and watch Netflix. And I wonder, you know, if we had locked in the 90s, how, how much of a struggle and how different things would be. No social media, no video calls. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> ben Jones, this has been a fantastic conversation. I'm so excited to hear and, and learn about Alambi Care um, and the innovative work that you're doing to stay online and continue to provide these really essential services to at-risk youth or, you know, youth in need throughout Australia. I really, really appreciate you spending your, your morning with me today. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Thanks again for tuning into today's episode of the eLearning Podcast. If you like what you heard, please do me the favor of following us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or whichever social media you prefer. Also, if you're interested in diving deeper on e-learning, I encourage you to get your free ticket to the e-learning success summit, where there are more than 70 hours of presentations on best practices. Just go to elearningsuccesssummit.com. And then finally, for the latest news, information, and resources about e-learning, come subscribe to our newsletter at lmspulse.com. Thanks.